Let us start at, 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 at Kugin in Aarhus. Uh, and I'm, oops, one of them's just run out. We'll come back there in a minute. She's coming back, coming back. Uh, no, she's back. Let's start with you uh, in, in Aarhus. And would you like to introduce yourselves, please? Yeah. Yeah, would you like to start? Yes, uh, my name is Stacey Cozart, and I am an educational developer at the Center for Teaching and Development in Digital Media. And I work, among other things, on teaching and learning in the international classroom. So I think it's relevant. Yeah, sure. Yeah? I'm Son Bengtsen. I'm the deputy director of CHEF. And uh, I apologize that not the more colleagues are here, but we have a conflicting. We have two conferences going on. So it's uh, yeah, very unfortunate timing. Very interesting topic. I research into doctoral education and philosophy of higher education. Thank you. We, have, we actually have a participant more uh, just coming in. Yes. Uh, we'll get to that person at the end then. Yeah. <laughs> Come right the way around. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, two with the Yemen, Ministry of Higher Education and Science. Good, thank you. And are you responsible for internationalization? I've been involved in. in so, you arms length as well. My name is Bernard Kahn I'm a colleague of two with different. And I am uh, have a bit of job following up on this whole English language right. initiative. Right. Yeah. Let's jump back. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. I'm Fabio De Vigo, coming here from um, since October. We are the EU from Italy. We work as a professor in the area of early child education. Good. Anna Holland, uh, professor at the University of Copenhagen and director of Center for Internationalization and Parallel Languages. Even is Eriksen, I'm the international coordinator and the head of the international office here at DPU. And I'm going to say to these dames, don't mumble, we want to hear your names. So, Eva Lisa, yeah. Karen Valentin, good. <laughs> Associate Professor in Educational Anthropology, <clears throat> good. Yeah, um, I'm Leanna, I'm a student. On, on which program? Energy. On the Anthropology, yeah. Education and Globalization <laughs> program. Good. Lana Todd, I'm also an AEG master student. Yeah. Sarah Mayo, uh, the same. You'll hear your back here, same. <laughs> uh, I'm Ashika Nirola, uh, I'm a PhD student here at DPU at the uh, Department of Education and Anthropology, and I'm working with highly educated migrants here in Denmark and their access to the labor market, and I'm really looking forward to talk to them soon. Good. Uh, I'm Kudont, I'm an uh, exchange student and also studying the AEG program. Good, Jennifer Danko, I'm also an exchange student and an student. Good. Fatima Awad, I'm also an AG student. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm Delia Barcoda, I'm working with Sue. <laughs> yeah. So I have studied sociology and uh, yeah. And now we are working with Sue with genealogy of uh, a group of people that Sue studied about 40 years ago. And we are going to digitize them and put them on the Okay, thank you. And I'm Ursula Lorenzen. I'm director of Deakin University's Europe office, which is actually a university based in Melbourne in Australia, but I'm based here in uh, Denmark. And I'm really excited to see that Orbis is leading this very important conversation at the moment, which is very hot around the universities that I talk to in Denmark. So congratulations and thank you for inviting me. Well, uh, my name is Rasmus Hartsbo. I'm a master student from Boston University, just generally interested. Good. And I'm Hans Sigor Jensen. I'm a professor of philosophy of science here. And in this context, I'm working with the Association of Doctoral Education, together with uh, American uh, and Chinese and South African, and a lot of interesting organizations coordinated by the European University Association in Brussels. Good. I'm Pavel Skagel from the University of Ljubljana. The topic of this event was important enough to make a stopover from my travel from Oslo back home. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the audience here. Yes, would you like to introduce Thank yourself? Thank you for being late. Um, Hannah, I'm a master's student here at the uh, Anthropology Education and Globalization Program. Good. And I'm originally I'm from the Czech Republic. <laughs> You're from the Czech Republic. I'm Kulsum, I'm a master's student of uh, Anthropology of Education and Globalization. Right. I think... Uh, what we'll do with the AEG students also, I'll do a round here. 
Which countries are you coming from? And I say countries because many of you come from two countries at least. Germany. Germany? United States. United States. Germany. Germany. Romania, but I've lived in Thailand, Singapore, U.S., and I think that's it, in the last seven years. <laughs> Good. Uh, from Nepal, but I also lived in Norway before and traveled to Canada and America and Everywhere. family all over. Right. <laughs> Belgium. 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 Germany. Germany. Danish with Egyptian origins. Good. Czech Republic, Spain, the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, I come from Pakistan, but I lived in Denmark for the last eight years. Right. Yeah. Excellent. And so we get to Sally. Introduce yourself, please. Just briefly, Sally Anderson, originally American, lived in Denmark 40 years. Uh, I teach the AEG students uh, a wonderful program, a wonderful group. So okay. I have a very invested interest. <laughs> Hannah? Yeah. My name is Hannah Adrensen. I'm an associate professor here at the Department of Educational Anthropology. I'm also here in my capacity of being the international coordinator at DPU, which is the academic international coordinator being sort of a liaison officer between the faculty and the department. And I recently got research funding for a project <coughs> on internationalisation of higher education. So multiple... Uh, yes. I'm of this. co of this, yes. I so, know. So my name is Sue Wright. I'm director for the Centre for Higher Education Futures and... I think with Greek Nielsen, the originators of the Anthropology, Education and Globalisation programme. And we have one more person in August. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, my name is Miriam and I'm a PhD student uh, working on higher education policies. Good. Excellent. So um, I think that's interesting that uh, DPU only has one international programme and... Um, We've managed to fill the room up. <laughs> Let me just start. Um, the, the issue that we want to oh, let me continue the introductions. Um, would you like to introduce yourself now? Uh, yes. Klaus Hong, leader of the School leader. And uh, Stavros, would you introduce yourself? Um, yes, I'm uh, the lecturer in the Department of Education and Sociology for the Compiled of Education. And one more chair here. Okay. I'll let you sit down rather than ask you to introduce yourself. Let's get started. Um, what we want to do here is, is very briefly, and am I standing in the way of the camera or something? <laughs> or the other issue is that we have the possibility of uh, recording this event because there are a lot of people who wanted to come and who haven't been able to. Um, so the question is whether anyone has an objection to us recording this event um, Using it, maybe, I don't know where we'll use it. Maybe we'll edit it and then put it on our, our website. Is that okay? Good. Um, am I blocking the camera now or is it all right? It's fine, it's fine. good. Good, okay. Um, the question that we raised for this seminar is how do Danish universities internationalise in the current policy context? And so what we want to do is just briefly try and review what the current policy context is, because I don't know about you two from the ministry, but we're quite confused about what it is. So if you see us making a mistake, please interrupt us and say, no, that fact is wrong, or put us right, because the more we can understand what the current policy context is, the better we are able to work out what to do in the future. Um, and then we want to uh, briefly end the, the talk by asking what internationalisation is and how we move forward in the current context. So that's the aim for today. Um, and so the, the question is, well, why deinternationalise? Um, and as far as I can understand, in 2013... The European Union Court decided that European students who go to Denmark and work for 10 to 12 hours per week and who take Danish lessons 
can be eligible for the student grant, the SU. And that the numbers of EU students have increased from 441 in 2013 to 11,000 in 2017. So that's quite a big increase. Then there was a, an issue around the technical and professional colleges that they were running courses for East and Central European students who claimed this view, took out a loan, gained a qualification and went home. And Dan's Volker Party decided that it wasn't, didn't want to use Danish taxes to educate Romanians. And here's a quote which says, the problem is that we have an offer here that uh, one doesn't have in Romania. So it's clear that they look up here to take a, an education um, but we have the need, first and foremost, to make sure that our uh, tax uh, krona go to educating the Danish young. So this is quite a bold statement from the leader of the Volk Party. Um, and so in 2017, there was a ruling to cut 1,700 English language places from the technical and professional colleges. And then in 2018, having been energised by this success, they decided to extend this strategy to universities. This is a table that comes from the Ministry's report, and it shows the, um, the number and the percentage um, of uh, English language students by kinds of education. And here's all, and here is candidate education, and here are the other ones. And by English language education uh, students, they mean students that are not Danish or Nordic, Nordic citizens and have not earlier had their education in, um, in, in Denmark. So that's, sorry, I've lost the end of the slide there. Um, so having decided why they wanted to de-internationalise, the next question is, well, how did they do it? And in 2013, Dad's Volk Party gained a political agreement that any uh, SU spending that went to EU students above 437 million krona, then the number of S the spending on SU must be, be reduced for Danish students. So it was a kind of zero sum. If the spending on foreign student goes up too much, then that has to mean fewer uh, Danish students get uh, funded. Of course, that's totally impossible. And in 2018, that ceiling was reached. So here's the explanation, again, from Dan's former party. If you put too many millions into... Uh, educating uh, into foreign students, <coughs> so you have to save on the Danish students, that's you. Um, therefore, the education has to go, has to be done in Danish, um, for if we offer English language education, so are we open for these wandering workers. Now, when uh, politicians are interested in the positive side of the European Union, they talk about the benefits of mobility. But suddenly, mobile knowledge workers have become wandering workers. Which is an interesting shift in language. Dance University, the Association of um, Rectors and Board Leaders uh, in Denmark, did a cost benefit analysis, um, worried of the way that this was going. Um, and they showed that Denmark benefits financially from international students in all disciplines, including the arts and humanities. The ministry then followed that up with analysis, which showed that only a third of students are working in Denmark two years after graduation. But the tax and everything else that they pay covers the cost of the other two thirds who go home. So actually, there's a benefit to international students to the economy. There's no economic argument for getting good Danish, uh, non-Danish students. But to protect the unproductive two-thirds, 
and to protect Danish as a scientific language. They cut 1,200 English language university places and they had to be cut by the autumn of 2019. So this gave the universities to less than, less than a year to implement a cut when they were already advertising for student places for autumn 2019. <coughs> and this shows the positive contribution to the economy and um, for candidate education, it's about 37% of the, um, the, the people with a candidate group degree who po contribute positively to the economy, which is higher than all the other categories of higher education. So again, what's the reason for cutting um, places in candidate education when there are benefits to the economy? The majority of the, there's more candidate people staying and working in Denmark than other categories of people. Um, and the aim, if the aim is to have more contribution into the labour market from students educated in Denmark, then why cut the number coming? Why not do something at the other end, trying to get um, students into the labour market? So then the universities were given this job of cutting, um, and I don't, this is one gap in my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I've managed to gather that these are the number of places that each of the universities was asked to cut, and I don't know what lay behind these numbers, but Orborg had to cut 290 places, Copenhagen 120, CBS 400, uh, SDU 160, and AU 80 places in arts, and I think also some places in business studies. Um, and each of the universities has gone about making these cuts in a different way. The way it was done in Aarhus, as we had a meeting between uh, the Education Anthropology and our pro dean to ask how the decisions were made, and he explained that now we have commando vice steering of the universities. This was a completely new phrase to me. I've been studying universities in Denmark since 2003, and I've never heard of it called commando vice steering. But if we go back to the reform of 2003, you can see how it's come about. Because the aim of one of the aims of the reform of 2003 was to make the universities into self standing institutions that were responsible for protecting their own freedom, their own ethics, and their own economy. And then the only way, as I understand it, they can relate to the ministry and to the outside world is either through uh, a contract or through an act of parliament. But the other way the ministry can influence what happens in the universities is by changing the funding. So there's meant to be, a, this is meant to be standing free of the ministry and um, protecting its own freedom and ethics. And then there are, con there are contracts all the way down. It's like somebody said there are turtles all the way down in the construction of the world. The construction of the university is made of contracts all the way down, where the politicians set the aim, which then the state administration, the ministry, has to turn into action, which then uh, reflects usually in the, in the um, development contracts with the governing boards, which are then sub the performance indicators are then subcontracted to deans, who then subcontract them to institute leaders. And... That's uh, meant to be then implemented on the ground. What's traditional with the university is that each of these levels is what's called a loosely coupled system, which is that the leader here acts as a buffer. So you get some ridiculous thought coming from an upper leader, and their role is to discuss it with colleagues and then say, OK, that was a ridiculous idea. Can we rethink it? Because it's going to have these effects. We can see the aim, how about doing it this way instead? So you negotiate up and forth. But what's happened now is we have what's called commando by steering, which is just all the way down. And Aarhus University, I think, was the first time that I've seen this kind of steering really, really come into effect since 2003. Because Aarhus was told, you've got a number to cut. And then that number went all the way down the system, a political number went all the way down. As far as I know, there was no academic discussion at all. There was no buffering to say, 
What's the academic implications of this? How do we do this? How do we do that? That's my own particular view. And so we, um, as, as our school only had uh, anthropology education and globalization as an international <coughs> candidate program, that's the one that got the places cut. Or not places cut, but the cut. And then there was a question, well, what is the cut? What, what is it? All which university has decided that the cut is to make an entrance requirement for the next batch of students that they have to have Danish language to level A. Can courses still be taught in English? What can we advertise? How do we put this over to the world about what we can do? How do we change the studio thing now when we're advertising for the places already? If we have to change over to English, who pays for all the costs of translating all the course materials and uh, all, the, all the, um, the sessions? And what's then the financial viability of Penanth and of DPU um, if, if we lose our international students? And I mean, this is a self-serving question, but what happens <laughs> to international staff? Um, so I'll just take you to one more slide here. This is too small for you to see, but there's a little red arrow here, which shows that our AEG course had, in 2016, 13 self-paying students, and in 2017, 20 self-paying students. Whereas all the other courses... Now, this is a big Erasmus Mundus course with three universities together. That's their total number. And this is the international programme, so that should have more. But look how many more we've got than all the other um, programmes. So we really are a really important, financially, we're an important uh, program for Aarhus University. So let's, how am I doing for time? Um, just focus on what's happened to educational anthropology. Um, the program has been running now for what, six years, seven years? Started in 2013. Right. And we previously we've got a, a Danish language master's program in pedagogical anthropology, and we are also the only department of pedagogical anthropology in Europe. So, in one way, there was a discussion that it's really, really important to keep pedagogical anthropology in Danish because then we can ensure that the scientific language of Danish keeps keeps developing. But on the other hand, this is too important a, a, a subject, a new disciplinary area, to hide it away in the corner of Denmark when it's the only place in Europe. So we need to be able to bring international students in and have our Danish students realise what the international students can contribute and have that kind of exchange. So we thought, well, we'll have two twin programmes. We'll keep the Danish programme going and developing and alongside it, we'll have a twin programme offered in English, which attracts international students as well as Danes. And we've always had about half the contingent as, as Danish students. Um, and this will generate a, an international environment in the department, which the Danish students can be part of. So we do some joint activities across the two, two, two programmes. This was carefully thought through over a number of years. Anna Holman was at the beginning as the head of department. We went through lots and lots of thinking about how do we protect and develop Danish and internationalise. So that was the way we did it. Um, so we've had uh, students from lots of different countries, but usually half also Danes, who want to work in an international environment and then go on and work for UNESCO or the World Bank or wherever they go. Um, and alongside that, then, we've really thought very, very carefully and researched very carefully the way we develop a pedagogy for the international programme. And this is where Hannah and Greek have really done some magnificent work. Hannah, with the group work that the students will know about. And the aim there, just in case you haven't realised it, the aim is that we bring students from different countries together who've got different experiences of learning, different educational styles that they've encountered. And
and different practical knowledge from their own countries or the other countries they've been in, and different literature that they've been using. And the aim is to get the students to listen to each other and learn from each other. And I think this is one of the great successes of the programme, that we actually, through that small group work and then bringing it together in Blenheim, we've actually begun to build, or we have built, really rich international environments amongst the students. And that has taken a lot of thought and a lot of work and it's been published um, in, in international journals. So this is a flagship programme. It's the only Department of Education Anthropology in Europe. We have placements in UNESCO and various other places. And we've been developing uh, quite a wide potential for international education and research exchanges because once you've got an important education programme like this, you then get researchers wanting to come and visit the department and work together. So it's not just education on its own. Educate, research-led education means that you build the two things up together. But in November 2018, we got full marks in our evaluation. This is a traffic light evaluation. You get red, orange, and green. So we got green all the way down. And then a week later, we were told that AEG is to be closed to international students. Can I just supplement a bit on this yes. before we go yes. to my slide? Yeah. yeah, because I think it's important what you're saying, that it's, it's a twin programme, but to underline that they're not identical twins. Right. They are uh, they are also different, as uh, the AD programme is called Anthropology of Education and Globalisation. So the, the one where we use English as the teaching language is, also has a different focus, which is more focused on global issues, and it's because also the students, we imagine the students being interested in different labour markets. I think that's an important point here that we'll keep, we'll maintain the Danish programme which is much more directed towards the Danish labour market where the whole thing about language is important because we think it's important that you have learned about these issues in the language that we're going to use afterwards. So if you're going to be employed in a Danish municipality it makes sense that you've been taught in Danish. So we maintain Danish not only as a scientific language but also as a working language because a lot of the hype about internationalization is that we are talking English at the, at the labour market, but we are to some extent, but not to full extent, at the Danish labour market. So we have a programme which is more oriented towards the Danish labour market, uh, taught in Danish, focusing less on the global issues, and then we have AG, which is directed to, much more towards a global labour market, and focusing more on global issues in the content. So there's this close link between content and the labour market, and the teaching language as well. So, and we would I mean, I would love to go into much more detail about the pedagogies. We can do that if you have any questions, because we've been doing a lot of development in terms of, of having the right pedagogies for this type of program, and our students can supplement on that. But let's sort of finish the presentation, and then if you have any questions, we can answer those. Just do it using that yes. one. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm, what I'm about to say now is also talking from the point of view as the international coordinator, somebody who's been involved in internationalization from a practical perspective for at least five years. And I have attended numerous meetings, I've been asked to comment on the uh, internationalization strategy, I've been asked to, to be a speaker at different events. So this is <coughs> talking from that position. And what we usually discuss, or at least used to discuss, when we talked about internationalisation at these events, and when we got something from the ministry, we had to react on these were the kind of issues. And now we're only talking about education, not when we talk about internationalisation of research, I should stress. So a common question was, how can we attract more international students? Uh, another common question was, how can we get more English medium instruction, also called EMI? Because these two things are obviously also related. And finally, how can we make sure that more students, like Danish students, study abroad for one semester? So these were the things that we typically discussed. And these seem like important issues, and they are to some extent. But what I found was that we never, these were always the how questions. That was what we discussed. How can we do this? But what is internationalization? And does this lead to internationalization by itself? it seemed that these questions were absent. It was a very instrumentalist approach to internationalization, as if we have international students in the classroom, hey, we've got internationalization. 
We are teaching in English. That's the same as internationalisation. We send Danish students abroad. I would say to some extent that's probably what comes closest to internationalisation, but we never talked about how we could make the most of that when these students returned. So that's why I would argue this is a very instrumentalist approach. It's a, but it's an easy one, because we can count that. It's, we can easily count how many. So that's why we sometimes get confused about what internationalisation is. We confuse the numbers, like the means with the with the purpose of it. So what I'd argue, what, what we forget or what we ought to discuss is what is internationalization in the first place? And it seems like, oh, but why shouldn't we get on with it? But I think it's very important that we start this discussion now where we are in the middle of a crisis in terms of internationalization. What is internationalization? And is it the same thing? Is it the same thing for arts and science? Is that the same? Is internationalization the same thing at an Aarhus University as in Copenhagen University or Roskilde University or Aalborg University? Is it the same thing in Denmark or Australia? There's a little language issue there. So these are important questions for us to discuss. And also, why do we internationalize? All these two questions. What are we trying to achieve with internationalization? Because when we just discuss the numbers, it's like we forget what is it we are actually trying to achieve. What are the gains? There are some underlying ideas about some gains, but if we don't spell them out loud, we are not really sure what we're talking about. And are these gains different from one discipline to another? Is internationalization the same thing at the AD program as it is at a program of physics? I would say no. But we never discussed this. So what is internationalization within different programs? And what are the costs of internationalization? As one of the teachers at an international program, I get frustrated quite often because there are costs and we don't talk about them. And when we have these two parallel programs, the twin programs, it's as we are sort of given the same resources to a large extent. But it's just more time consuming for all sorts of reasons for students who are not sort of grew up here. And I love it, and my students probably know that I love teaching at this program, so it's not cost in terms of it being uh, not productive. And I, I mean, it's, it's really great with all that diversity, but it takes more time when you have to explain about the Danish educational system. And if you only have one program, the transaction costs of taught in English, the transaction costs are really high. And just like if you go to the canteen, you don't know what food it is. And I've asked them numerous times, could you please put little signs, what's, what's pork and what's not pork, what's beef? I mean, this whole thing about being an international community is simply something that takes more resources. And these resources are not there. And then it becomes, like, it becomes the individual teacher who has to pay the cost of internationalization. Because that extra time which has to be put into it, we have to find it somewhere. But there's also so much we can lose by not internationalizing. And by not talking about these things, we don't know what we are actually losing. If we don't know what the gains of internationalization are, we don't know what we're losing at the moment. And it all becomes numbers, and I think this is so much more than numbers. So, all this should be discussed before we discuss how can we internationalize. That is my point. And that being said, I'll start by saying, what are the tools for internationalization? Because that was also what this presentation was supposed to be about. How can we internationalize in the current context, policy context? And there are some tools for internationalization. And this is also based on the research project for which I just got funding. And we're looking at outgoing mobility, things traveling abroad, that's one tool for internationalization. Incoming mobility, international students attending Danish universities, they are in this room right now, so we see they're still here. And English medium instruction. Internationalizing the curriculum. That is something we talk less about, but that means taking a close look at the curriculum when we have Danish medium instruction. What's in the curriculum? Do we think carefully about sort of what kind of literature are we using? Does that represent a certain view, a certain place, a certain country, a certain national logic, for instance? It's also something that would be quite evident if we have comparative education. Then, of course, we are comparing the differences from one place to another. But how can we internationalize the curriculum for other disciplines as well, where it's not quite as obvious? 
I'm trained as a human geographer, so for me, sort of this geographical comparison seems obvious, but, but for other disciplines, it's less obvious. Anthropology is another discipline where it sort of comes natural. But how can we internationalize the curriculum within other disciplines? And it's also about helping us to see the taking for granted. That is what the internationalization, if I had to say what, what, what internationalization is about, why we're doing it, it helps us question the taking for granted. When I have international students, they will ask me questions which my Danish student won't ask me because we, they take it for granted just like I do. So I think in part of what internationalization is about <coughs> is about helping us questioning the taking for granted. We can also, to some extent, do that by internationalizing the curriculum and working carefully with the curriculum. That is my argument. Along with internationalization comes sort of a new field of research, which is called internationalization at home. And that focuses on this thing that not only what we've seen in Denmark last year, but in general, there are problems with this idea that internationalization can only be obtained through mobility. Not all people have the same... Uh, possibilities of being mobile, so how can we internationalize at home? It can be through the internationalizing the curriculum, but it can also be through drawing on the resources we have when students come abroad, come home from being abroad. It can be, be better at linking when we have international researchers, international scholars. How can we draw on their, of their experiences? How can we draw them into our teaching as well? And we have internationalized international specialization without um, English medium instruction. We see that at Danish teacher education, we have this internationalized international specialization taught in English, but with a focus on international topics. So the good news is the good news is there are lots of other ways of internationalizing. But the bad news is, and also international staff, as I was just talking about. The bad news, however, is that if we take away English medium instruction, which is what has been taken away to a large extent, then what will happen? Well, out goes incoming mobility, because if we don't teach any programs in English, we can't have international students. So, out goes... What was that? I took out... Internationalization at home. If internationalization at home is also drawing on all these other experiences, that can go as well. Also, because the uh, outgoing mobility is something we will lose because we have this balance that if we want to send out students, we should be able to receive students as well. So, if we can't send out students, we can't, we can't receive students, we can't send out students, then we will. All our international agreements will break down. So this one disappears. And international staff, what can we do if we haven't got any programs where they can teach? I know that if you are, get a position as an associate professor or professor, you are obliged to learn Danish within three to four years. But we have many other like PhD students who are here for a shorter period of time. They are not obliged to learn Danish. So we have a lot of international staff at the university who we can't use if, we can't, if they can't teach in English. So my argument is there are other ways of internationalizing without using English medium instruction. But if we haven't got one single program within a department, it's really difficult. And this is what has happened at DPU. So the lack of one program taught in English affects not only that program, but our whole internationalization strategy in a way that is much more severe than you would think when you just hear that we have changed one program from being taught in English to being taught in English. So to sum up, Internationalization is not the same thing as English medium instruction. And I have, some of you have heard me before, I have been critical of this tendency also in Denmark to focus so much on English medium instruction. And I attended a conference recently where they used the expression which I thought was really wonderful. They talked about this focus on English medium instruction as self-imposed imperial. <laughs> because what happens is that we try to live up to the standards of the UK, of the US, to some extent of Australia, because we want to fit in. And a wonderful story I heard at Olbo University some years ago was at an engineering program. 
this uh, engineer had been told that, told that he had to teach in English, and then he asked, am I allowed to use Danish case studies now? <laughs> and I think that shows the problem we have when we change so many programs, especially in engineering and science, into English medium. At a uh, university like Olbo University, which also to a large extent caters for the local labour market, you'll end up having students being taught in English, taught about British case studies, would you call them suited for the local labour market? Not necessarily. So, what I'm saying here is not that English medium instruction is the only thing we should do, but it's important for, you, for a department to have at least one programme. And because it's a prerequisite for the other tools. But what we need to discuss is that we should carefully consider which programme do we actually choose to be English medium instruction. <coughs> And the pro project that I just got funding for is also about looking into the sciences, because at the Faculty of Science at the University of Copenhagen, they have 33 master programmes. Out of 33 master programmes, 30 are taught in English. I don't know if that's the best way of internationalising in Denmark, of using our numbers of EMI programmes. And I don't know if we get better uh, high school teachers in physics and maths and chemistry if they are being taught in English. I don't know if they will be better teachers in the Danish high school. Perhaps I have an opinion about that. So we need to discuss what and why of internationalisation. That's where I'd like to end. And we end up with um, a report that's just come out of the Ministry which is the picture that Denmark is projecting of itself. <laughs> thank you for your attention. <laughs> um, good, thank you very much for that. Um, now, I've got, I want to open this up to the floor, um, and I think we could do it in a number of different ways. Um, we've got a lot of students here, we've got some international visitors here, We've got our head of school here. We've got people from the ministry here. We've got uh, Anna from another university here. So I think it would be interesting if we made sure that all those categories of people had the chance to say something. Um, so should we start with the furthest away? Um, Can I um, ask a question from mm -hmm. a category that has had some experience in international programs at DPG? Um, because I was wondering while listening to this presentation, is that why you haven't thought of uh, applying for an Erasmus Mundus? Mm -hmm. since, we asked to, and we were Since the DPU has a 10 year experience on this. Yeah, we asked to do that three years ago. Was it three years ago? We asked for AEG to be an Erasmus Mundus. And that you was applied. Well, we, we asked the leadership if we were allowed to, and we were not allowed to apply. You are not allowed? No. Why? No reason given. But that would have been an obvious way of protecting an international programme, and that's why we were wanting to apply three, three, three years ago, was it, Gus? I don't know. We had long discussions with Eva Fiela, and she had discussions with you. Um, and the answer was, no, we're not allowed to apply for an international programme. Whereas at that time, I don't know what's happened now, there were no <coughs> anthropology of education courses or anything like it in Erasmus Wonders. So it would have you know, been a short because mile away. You seem to be to have, to have all the conditions. You're an established programme for yeah. five years, you have international connection, yeah. everything is ready. Yeah. You've got You're a unique yeah. uh, subject area, yeah. as you said. Yeah. So all the yeah. conditions are perfect to apply. Yeah. But we aren't allowed to apply unless we have permission from the leadership. I just wanted to make a point about the categories of internationalization that you presented. Internationalization of the curriculum should be subdivided, in my opinion, so that you have a special category, which is internationalization of the curriculum structure. We have a very interesting case at the moment going on at the film school, because they try to reform the education from a very Danish, you might say, local structure and experience to a more international structure with bachelor and a master. And there's a lot of discussion and resentment uh, against it, so you might say. And you might say we also have a 
similar but also very interesting discussion about the characters used or character scale and in Denmark mm-hmm. and the reason the marking scale. Yeah, marking scale and the reason for the Preston one which is uh, uh, everybody de- everybody hates it in a way but there's an international use and reason for it Catherine Richardson who I thought was the main creator of it for her, it was extremely important that it would be comparable to other countries and the system, especially ones that are not so fixed on averages as we are. So the A, B, C, and you probably know, um, should be easily translatable. So those are two forms of internationalization that is not at all connected to the issue of teaching or using English. They are simply uh, con- uh, connected to it. A, a, a process of internationalization that has gone on mainly through the EU and the Bologna process that in started, and I think yeah. that is also important to, to yeah. take into account. Yeah, very important. Good. Yes, Pavel. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm extremely glad that I had the opportunity to stop for four hours in Copenhagen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the first uh, the first discussion uh, on uh, what uh, internationalization in higher education means actually in the new period. Yeah, there are so many things to comment, but I will I will take just one. You mentioned at the beginning the taxpayers' argument. Yeah. So uh, Danish taxpayers should not pay for Roman- Romanian students. Mm. If That's I not my view. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Just, this is just yes. a quotation. Yes. Just to let you know, uh, uh, voices from another part of European Union. Um, there, um, I will not go into details. Just, just, uh, just uh, 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 another short quotation. There are ideas among <laughs> in Eastern European countries. To not to allow, for example, graduated nurses to go to Denmark without paying their home country for ground, for, for, for fees. You understand? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I that's, extend, we, are all, we are coming to a new Europe yes. in which we build uh, common walls, mm-hmm. Trump walls, mm-hmm. not made of baton, I heard yesterday, but... <laughs> not concrete, but... Yeah. Yeah, 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 but that's 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 a. But I think problem. that's a, a really important point because I mean now in London, for example, the teaching um, most they send a delegation to South Africa every year to recruit maths teachers. So South Africa has paid for the training of the maths teachers in London. And if you look round the room, I mean, we went round the number of countries. You've all had how many years education in your own country before you came here? And that's a free gift to Denmark. Whereas the way the sums are calculated, you know, they become a cost from the day they set foot in Copenhagen. No, they become an asset from the day they set foot in Copenhagen because they're bringing all that years of investment in their education with them that they're contributing to Danish education. I mean, the, the, the way the, the, barrier, the, the, the sums are constructed and what's included in a sum and what's excluded is a study of its own, and I've started doing that. But I, I think it, it's something which we really need to take forward. We're thinking how we take, where we go forward. This way of how the calculations are made, I think, really has to be contested. And that the idea of Slovenia not letting nurses come to Denmark unless they pay back their education, I think this is, this is the next step if we go into this kind of... We're not any longer in a European Union, we're now in the bounded areas. Um... Are there any comments from the students? Who Are there any questions or any comments or any thoughts? Especially looking to go forward. How do we take this forward? Where do we go now? Okay, I'll let you think about it and come back. Sally? Yeah, maybe I could compliment a bit because uh, one of the most wonderful things about teaching this program is the opportunity to do cross-cultural comparison at all levels, which is what Hannah was talking about when she said making a familiar strange and a strange familiar. This idea, it's, it's a fantastic pedagogical tool that we can do on the Danish side, but we can't do it as effectively because of the <coughs> taken for granted, being a little more taken for granted in the room. Um, when we teach, we make a special effort to look through the different languages 
we look through the Danish language, we look through the English language, we do not just put concepts out in English and leave them there as the only truth about the world. We check them out through Chinese, through Korean, through all these other languages. So what is society, how do you say society in Korean? You know, oh, we don't say it, we draw these pictures. Okay, how do you say it in China? How do you say it in Romania? And, and what are the connotations? And what are the connotations? Yes. How does it go in? Because the Danish society work does all this word does all this work that other society words don't. We can have these wonderful discussions. Um, and at the same time, I, I have to say one more thing before I'm going to let you speak to that, is that at least maybe mm, a quarter of some of the students I've been teaching are married to Danes. Mm. They're married to Danes. They're staying here. Their children are growing up in Denmark. I was in this position myself. These are not just foreign students. They are people staying in Denmark, married to Danes, opening up a possibility for them to get a higher education such that they can contribute as the situation I was in back in the 1980s. And they're One, excluded by this definition. And they're excluded by the definitions. And that is, I mean, have a look. Get the numbers if that's what we have to do. But part of this is educating people coming to Denmark because they've married in for some reason or whatever. And if we're excluding them, I can't see the reason for it. But I would love my students, I'd love you guys to speak to this cultural plurality of the pedagogy. Is it working? How, how do you see the groups? And what do you talk about at 9 o'clock in the morning? When you're to <laughs> we, we set them loose in small groups and, and give them, well, rough ideas what they should be talking about, and then they go off on their own. So. Yes, there's no. a lot of self-study. So I'm speaking from a position of being an ethnic and religious minority in Denmark. And I, and throughout my life, I've always sort of been in English or international schools. Um, but when I started high school, I actually started at a Danish high school to sort of, I don't know, become more local. I was looking in different ways, but in my educational setting, I wanted to try that. Um, but there was this sort of polarization between students of like, there is... Um, a minoritization process happening between students of like ethnic minorities and Danish ethnic minorities, Danish majority. Um, and, and that wasn't something I had experienced in my previous international spaces. And that's why I decided to pull out of that because the sense of identity and belonging was really being uh, challenged you know, continuously. And that wasn't a place where I could have thrived academically. So I decided to sort of pull out and go into the international educational you know, um, space. space again. I did my bachelor's in Austrian University at an international program. Um, but again, we did use Danish cases, so it wasn't because it was sort of only globally oriented. But it made me, again, take, questioning the taking for granted, questioning the fact that um, why is it that when I enter a Danish educational setting, I was perceived as, I got very stereotypical questions, and that was who I was supposed to be and who I was supposed to answer to. Whereas in an international setting, they were like, you could be whoever you are, and really honestly don't care. Um, so there is an, there's an element of identity, there's an element of belonging, of ac academically thriving, or just thriving as a human being generally, that I found in international spaces that I couldn't find in a Danish setting. Um, with that said, I am interested in looking into why can't we have that in a Danish school or a Danish educational mm -hmm. setting. So I'm taking the challenging, taking for granted, and taking it back and you know, anchoring it in a Danish context. That's what I'm hoping to sort of do. Right. And what you're saying there also, the two PhD students I've had looking at the Sino-Danish Centre in Beijing, mm -hmm. where the Danish students and the Chinese students are meant to be working together, there's that same division mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a, a real problem about getting the Danish students to take international students seriously yeah. and, and question themselves. Yeah. Um, and I think that's... a yeah. Just a comment to that, like it, it might also be sort of tied into, for example, when we're talking about internationalization, we always think of like, you have to come to me. Yeah. Mm. Whereas here they're being asked, well, you have to come to them as well and sort of lean in the middle. Right. So, you know, so that's what I mean. I think that's extended to the, the workplace as well. I mean, companies are struggling to keep skilled migrants mm. here. They want skilled migrants. But then how they find that environment, how they meet that environment is very similar to what she's describing in that they don't necessarily feel that they feel, don't feel part of it. So, I mean, this is an economic um, problem as well. Yeah. Right, good point. Yeah. We've got some more...
points from it. Yes. Uh, and one thing that I also want to add on, because I have been working with highly educated migrants for some years now, is when we're talking about internationalization of students, we also need to talk about how to retain them who already have education here. Because uh, many of the people that I talked with, they really wanted to stay in Denmark, but with the changing immigration rules and regulations yeah. in general, yeah. it is making them really, really frustrated. So even if there is no cut in the education program, they might not come because there is no future for them after what will they do after they finish education. So maybe there is a need for a bigger discussion about the immigration changes, like immigration policy and changes and stuff. How can they help? How can the state help them when they have establishment cut to get access to the labor market? Maybe we need to talk about that as well. And that's also one of the points that the student union has raised about the ministry's policy, um, because uh, they've been saying that it it, it costs the, the salary level that you have to attain to get permission to stay. I don't yeah. know the details of this, perhaps you know it all. It it's so high, high that many, many students can't jump from being a student to getting that immediately, and therefore they have to leave the country. Yeah. So the question about how... I mean, I think the really, really important issue here for Denmark, because I can speak as a foreigner, is how do you internationalise the Danish labour market? Absolutely. I think that's the crucial question. Mm -hmm. But as ever, with Danish labour market policy, it becomes blamed on the universities for not having done it. But that's a bit beyond what universities can be responsible for. <laughs> but I think that, that issue is really, really the crucial one. And then once you've got that as the frame of the argument, then what's the role of universities <coughs> within that becomes a secondary question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Julia. Um, it, in addition to this, I, I've, I've ex I experience all of these things. These are very personal to me. I've considered staying in Denmark, but it just feels impossible. I've been here for five or six months. I still don't have a bank account because it is so hard to go through all these bureaucratic procedures. So it goes beyond just finding a job. I have the job, but I can't get paid for it because I can't get the bank account. So there are all these things that complicate your existence as a foreigner in Denmark. So it's beyond, it goes beyond being a student. And on the same note with the bank account, I don't get SU yet. And there are many of my classmates who got in the work last year, but now the, the plan has passed. So a lot of us actually didn't get SU last semester. And getting SU is not this simple process as a European citizen. It's not like you're Danish and you just get it. You really have to get to uh, complete those hours. I mean, when you're first settling here, it's difficult to get. So this idea that we all get SU and we're taking it away from Danish students, it's actually a lot more complicated than it's noted on all of these websites. So it's always fascinating to me that, uh, and, and we're trying to pay taxes. We're all trying to pay taxes in order to get that SU. So it's, it's just like in the language and the way it's presented, it never quite uh, makes sense to me. No. No, so there are micro exclusions working yeah. through the yeah. system. And in yes. addition to that, uh, we are most of us are enrolled in Danish classes, Danish language classes, right. and we just found out that our teacher was actually put away because the language schools are uh, in financial trouble because of this new new system of language <laughs> schools. So we actually we don't know right now if we're going to continue with this language school. So like we're trying, but at the same time there are all these obstacles in the way. Mm -hmm. And again, I would agree with you that it's a very personal issue. I'm not from the Czech Republic originally, and I, I haven't really thought of myself as like a Eastern European. But like coming here, you know, there are all these like yeah, ideas of who, who I am and who I'm supposed to. And hearing about you know like Central and Eastern Europeans coming, <coughs> claiming as you taking a loan and leaving, like that never occurred to me. And I'm sure there there have probably been cases like that. At the same time, I I also not getting as you yet, uh, working really hard to get it, but it's. <laughs> I think we're all students just trying to like make our living here, and uh, it is not easy. And I understand some, some people have it harder than others, but uh, yeah, I think it's important to listen to the stories of people who are actually trying to, to live their life here. Trying to get SU. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. yeah, I'd just like to add to that. Uh, I'm Danish myself, but I have a Polish uh, girlfriend who's been studying in Denmark for five years, and, and, and she feels so alienated that we're actually planning to move to Krakow to, in Poland uh, for, for at least for, for a while because uh, she can't really see any future in, in the Danish um, yeah, society. Right. So I think what's getting clear is that Denmark is complaining that international students don't stay here after being done with their studies, mm -hmm. but it's just kind of like impossible to stay or it's like 
really hard. Like my wish was really to move to Denmark and to make my life here. And right now I don't know anymore if that's still my dream or not because it's so hard to actually settle down here. Right. And I speak Danish, so it's like not language barrier anymore, but still. Even so, it's hard. Yeah. Right. Yes, Lisa. Yeah, a few comments. Uh, I have been here for 10 years and I have always found it very absurd that we, according to the official uh, strategy, strive for keeping international, keeping and attracting and keeping <coughs> international talent. And we have had the Rascals Montes program that you have been deeply involved in. We had it for 10 years. And I don't know how many of these students that I see in PhD positions all over the world. And again, also with the AP program, I just heard about the Rachel just got a PhD position there now at the Roskilde University. It keeps on and on and on that we here at DPU have fantastic students. We have attracted fantastic students. We give them the education and then we'll leave them. Yeah. Not DPU, but, you know, the system. <laughs> and then something else pretty interesting that I have seen uh, that is actually not the Eastern Europeans, but the Norwegians who are taking SU and loans and going back to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, even more absurd that the Scandinavian students, they don't need to prove that they need Danish at A-level. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's and the they're excluded from all of this reduction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also wonder, sorry, about student mobility because that's obviously where you work oh, yeah. as well. I mean, if you're shutting down English language courses, obviously, you know, you can't get the incoming um, students. Then your students are actually, if they go outside of the European Union, are going to have to pay and they'll drop out of the system. So you're not going to get the tuition funding or the allocation you get for the government for that for that semester they're abroad. So that's another part of it as well that's not great for, for the economy. So that's a bit short-sighted. It's uh, absolutely... Uh common that uh, to see that we need to internationalize here in Denmark, especially sending more and more students out. And when I started, I think we sent around six students out per year, and now the number is uh, 60. Mm -hmm. So it has gone very much up. It is like that, that the balance is not even. It's not, I mean, we are sending students to the UK, but we cannot receive students from the UK here at DBU because they can only send the bachelor students because the master in the UK is just one year. So it doesn't work with that. And we haven't any courses to offer at bachelor level. So what do we do? Well, we are just thankful that, that, that we can send them. And it's the same with lots of other countries. They will receive our students, but they don't send them because their students with the Erasmus funding cannot pay for the housing up here. So... You know, yeah. you juggle around and you talk about the summer courses at Aarhus. Or you do, like I did uh, last year, you create practical places for students from Eastern Europe or uh, Southern Europe so you can actually send students to their universities. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, it's, it's absurd and certainly we cannot keep up that way. Come on, I think you have a point. So, um, I mean, now we're talking a lot about student mobility and what will happen to the students, which is really important. Having worked in education and migration myself, I mean, it's, it's really important. But I think I'm equally concerned about what will happen to the university and what will happen to DBU. Because I was employed here in 2003, the same year as you, I think. And it was a very different university, a very different department, whatever it was at that time. I thought at the time it wasn't the university. <laughs> um, and it, of course, it has a very strong Danish legacy in some sense, with the whole history of Danish teacher training education, which is really important, really interesting. But so many things have actually happened over that, these 15, more, well, 16 years. Uh, and, and, and I think that's really where, I mean, it's not to say, it, it, it was a much more national kind of national place in that sense. And, and I think it has changed in so many ways, which I'm really, really worried about that we are going to lose. I mean, not just from this only thing, of course. But I think when we're talking about completely disconnect the whole area of research and all this from from the student but which is and the whole internationalization of education but and these things are completely interrelated. I mean that was what you showed with taking out these. I mean and we're employing new international staff and it's really nice, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to yeah. you. <laughs> no, but it's and it's important. But again if we actually take out that 
part, that part in the puzzle that hadn't shown up before, it's going to be really difficult. And DPU is not going to be what it used to be or what was Danish, uh, Denmark's Lehrer High School anyway. No. So, I mean, the, the time has changed. Let's move so, over to yeah, Klaus. That was actually just an invitation for Klaus to Welcome. Klaus is our head of school and has the enviable task of uh, <coughs> developing a new strategy in this context. So, what's the future for internationalization? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Uh, I hope it will be right. Uh, but of course, I, I also recognize the, the setback and related to uh, <coughs> the AD uh, program. Uh, this is, a, of course, a huge setback for DPU, as well as uh, uh, this is uh, the, this is a setback for Denmark in general. That uh, that the, the political decision that you uh, described um, in your introduction has been made. And of course, you cannot uh, rationalize it on an economic level because it's it's politics and, and uh, has uh, all the uh, the rationality or irrationality that comes with it. So, in that sense, I have nothing to add to what has been been said. But but uh, <coughs> as as Karen said, so uh, we have. Uh, more intensely for the last uh, three, four years, uh, tried to internationalize uh, DPU, uh, both in terms of research uh, and in terms of uh, education, and uh, also in terms of uh, incoming researchers, as Fabio was here, uh, and um, and, of, and of course. Uh, I think that the internationalization of research is uh, in a partly related, but also has a relative autonomy in relation to uh, internationalization. Uh, at least we have uh, experienced uh, uh, when we have uh, positions that we get uh, a lot of more uh, international candidates for our positions than, uh, than ever before. Uh, and um, in that sense, um, this is, has a relative autonomy as, 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 as far as I can, uh, can see. Um, and uh, we will keep, it, it's no secret that if you looked at DPU uh, five years ago, and if you look at uh, DPU in terms of, of uh, research and publications and international journals and, and so forth, uh, and also international connections. We have been uh, systematically uh, trying to internationalize uh, uh, our publications and, and also our way of making networks and uh, alliances. So, uh, so in that sense, I, 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 not, I, I don't see a one-to-one -one connection between uh, the internationalization of research and uh, internationalization of uh, of uh, education. Of course, uh, we, uh, as I said, uh, this is a setback setback uh, for us because, of course, it would be easier also to have international students and uh, uh, being being taught in English. Uh, but um, of course, we also have uh, the. Um, the challenge, but also um, the chance that we also would like to internationalize on a bachelor level. We would like to get more than one bachelor that we have uh, uh, today, but also uh, being able to introduce students on a bachelor level uh, to teaching that goes on in English uh, and also internationalization in that sense that they actually meet more international literature uh, uh, than they have met before because that's also a, a, a part of the internationalization of, of DPU. Uh, so um, in that sense I see it actually uh, that we will keep on international, uh, nationalizing in relation to uh, research and also in, in uh, I also expect that we will actually attract uh, people, uh, candidates for positions coming from uh, abroad. Uh, and, um, and then I hope that we, I think that we will probably uh, get a new government 
<laughs> That's not a no-help business. Well, we'll, we'll fix it. <laughs> can I, with, uh, I think that's the most positive thing you've that, said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I just ask you, though, I mean, because this isn't an automatic thing. I mean, we could get a new government and they don't fix it. Um, so I, I'm, there's not, also, I'm not so sure. No, but there's also a question about what are the university... I mean, you're at the bottom uh, tier of leadership. Yeah. You have access to what's going on off the street. What is the university leadership doing in trying to make sure that when we get a new government, this is reversed? Uh, I, I, I know that the director's office uh, uh, was uh, filing for also for the AAG as, as well as they could. I have trust in that, but I also knew that it was a very hard uh, situation. Uh, so, uh, so, but I know that, that as far as I'm uh, informed, they will keep on fighting uh, to undo what has been done. And um, I mean, I I have access, but I don't have that much access to. Uh, uh, so, but but I but I'm still. Um, I'm still uh, confident that they will try to uh, to change the situation, and with them and the rest of the universities. And when that happens, and I also know that uh, a lot of politicians, not maybe from the Danish Folk Party, but uh, uh, wasn't too glad and proud uh, of this decision, and they, for the same reason, they would probably be eager. Uh, to to change the situation. Right. Yeah. When when we get a new government yeah. and yeah. when the rector wins in these arguments and yeah. he's been putting yeah. AEG forward as yeah. a case, can we be assured that AEG will be up there on the list of restorations that we get put back into an English language? Mm. Or will it be, oh, now we've got an opportunity to do some wonderful new things. Oh, that's five on AEG. Let's do something else. <laughs> <that is easy. laughs> okay. uh, I, um, as I said, I'm quite sure that, uh, that uh, the director and the people around him uh, was actually fighting for AEG. Uh, so uh, I, I cannot imagine that they, uh, if they fix all the other things, that they should leave AEG out of it. That was okay. the question. That will be very Keep an surprising. eye on that for us, would you can ask? Yeah. Can I ask the people from the ministry if you would like to add any comments or reflections on the discussion? Well, yes. <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of points. Um, um, one is this idea that uh, you said that uh, English medium instruction had been to a large degree made impossible. I think to a large degree does a lot of work in that statement. If, if uh, as soon as you look at anywhere but DPU, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay, just yeah, yeah. yeah I was talking from, from, from this the, place. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah. because we, we, we still have in Denmark oh, yeah, yeah. two three hundred English language master programs. So yeah. I think from, uh, internationalization uh, and English medium instruction is still very much possible. Mm. In regards to this decision, we, uh, this uh, initiative, uh, we also wrote a letter that <laughs> there need, needs to be some more dialogue about it, but saying that you could have, previously it's been that you can, either you have a Danish language program or you have an English language program. Mm -hmm. And there's officially <laughs> very little uh, possibility to, to teach mm -hmm. English uh, language courses in a Danish language program. We have changed that now. So you can make half, basically, as long as the majority is in Danish, then 49% can be in some other language. And the same goes with the English language programs. You can also mix languages there. So that's a, a, a possibility for your English language uh, researchers, uh, professors, to teach um, in, but the, in Danish But the students context. have to have to Danish A to get in? Well, you will have to be able to speak the language to be in a Danish language course, yes. Yeah. As, 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 as you have to have English B to be able to study mm. it. As it's, so exchange yeah. students coming across, say, from Australia for a semester? Exchange for students bachelor. is a different thing. Okay. So it's nothing to do with it's, nothing this. To is, do. This is only four degrees. Yeah. Yeah. And exchange, uh, and what we usually refer to as mobility, mm. yeah. has nothing to do with this except the practical implications of fewer 
English language programs making mobility more difficult. Yes. Yeah. Possibly. And where there's clearly a local issue, or whose issue about if you only have one English language program, mm. then it's more difficult. That's the other point is that from the ministry. Both departments at, at Faculty of Arts, yeah, that's one of the three departments, and two yeah. of them have been hit in this way. Yeah. So my point was perhaps we should have yeah. discussed more to make sure that all yeah. departments could have at least one, because I know that it's yeah. still numerous, yeah. so I think there's an unbalance yeah. there. And that's, so a, and that's completely an internal AU decision, <laughs> which <laughs> programs do not. But they got, but they got it very, and, and it's not an arts. We, we didn't have a number for arts, we had a number for all university, mm. and then all university had to decide where to cut that. Mm. They had to decide that in a very short period of time, mm. so it wasn't an easy decision. And, and was, who was responsible for that short period of time? That was the government. That was the, 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 or the, the ministry. That was, you, you, you got the number, and then you needed, mm. basically, you needed the reduction for 2019. Mm -hmm. Which made some very practical limits to how to pick that. <coughs> yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah. And that's worth fun. picking up because Aarhus University cut, made whole programs that cut yeah. English access, for, uh, yeah. in, English language students' access was cut for whole programs. CBS, as far as I can understand, has just said a, a kind of general cut across the whole of CBS. So it doesn't affect any particular program. No, that's not true. No, this yeah, it's a, I think it's a mix. On, on, at most universities, there's a mix. They're shutting down programs, mm. changing the language to Danish, yeah. putting in a, a language like a Danish A. There's different tools being used. Okay. Um, and, and I think in, in Copenhagen, they mostly just took on, on, on the Faculty of Science, they took a, a number of places from the programs and didn't yeah. shut down programs yeah. mm. uh, but that's a very uh, how can you say that's not the most precise way to, to meet the target no but it retains the strength of those programs yeah but you, you cut them with, yeah but it's not like cutting a whole program no, you, you reduce the the economic viability of the program yeah, yeah. but you don't yeah. collapse the whole program and that's yeah. That's an issue. That, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you snuck away. The leadership of all the universities was responsible for. Yeah. But, so, but so the general idea was that we had this number, and the, the number is it's very tech, a lot of this is very technical, um, and, and, and so also the category of an English language student is not, I think, it's not a normative thing, and people shouldn't be excluded. It's, it's, it was made as an analytical category basic, how can we follow, which is because we don't know which programs are in which languages, that's not possible for us to see. How is it an analytical category? Um, it, it's it's, oh, it's a, what do you call it, a database category, it's how you can identify, um, it's because you can't see which the language programs are. So it's just basically who can you follow in the data stream, how and then how do you find the registers in the data statistics registers? Yes. So it's, it's not a, an exclusive uh, a category made to exclude anybody. It's only an analytical it, uh, way to... How do analytical categories not exclude people? Well, it, yeah, well, clearly it does exclude in the analysis, but it's not like a normative, and right. now you're all excluded because you're not Scandinavian. That's not... That's a, that's a but but that's it works in practice. That is, that, that is what happens. Yes, it, Yes, that is the practical implication. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but, the, but the point is, but people are not there, there so there's a, there was, but the basic one should, you took the number because it's not part of the follow language, English language program from the data set. So one way to, to identify an English language program was to say, when we have students that we must assume are studying in an English language program. And we must usually assume that people that are not from the Scandinavian Scandinavian country and it's not studied in Denmark is in the English language program. That's the most usual. But you have outliers clearly, like in, in Copenhagen, the bachelor's programs at the humanities. But they these, also got them and they're all in Danish. So it's, but these non analytical categories, yeah. um, they, for example, exclude people who are married to Danes and lived here 20 years but didn't do their education in Danish. But nobody's no one excluded from the, the part. The, the second point is that. that, that so you made, you made this analysis to find a number, to identify, and then you said, how many of these people in this group works in Denmark after two years? So tell me and again so, how so that number was found. Well, I didn't find, I didn't no, do how, the analysis. No, I'm not saying you. How was the number found? How do you mean? You said first they found a number, 
And this yeah. is this category. You do, yeah, you identify this group, English language students, defined as it was in your slide. Okay. And then you follow that group in the registry, and you can see how many of these people are employed in Denmark. Okay. As um, often, and that's also how you make the effects analysis, like the cost analysis, or the... the, the it wasn't a cost okay. clearly. Yeah. It was. Um, it was a benefit. It was a benefit. Yeah. Um, and then, and then you got, could identify programs where most students leave, and does not get employment in Denmark. Right. And and on the basis of that, programs where a very low rate of students uh, got employment in Denmark, they they produced the number there. So, based on that, the the, the reduction targets were produced. But this is all, as you can clearly hear, this is all on fairly sketchy ground, data-wise. And that was why you said, this is not going to go out, and, and, that, and now always University has to cut these programs with these numbers. This is an, a target number, and now we'll have a dialogue with Aarhus University and all the universities, <laughs> and see how can you adjust the intake of, the, of English language students, and how can you heighten the retainment? How, how, how can you help ensure they stay in Denmark longer? Afterwards? So the, the calculation was based on working out which yes. students, which English language students, even if they don't speak English, um, went to which courses that have a low employment level. We must so assume they speak English. Then you worked out in, 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 yeah. in, then you worked out the number of those, and that gave you the figure for each university. And then that figure was given to the university, and the figure the university could then choose where to make the cuts. Yes. Basically. Ish. I think there are two Ish. things which yes. are quite important to add here, could be relevant to add. And one thing is that this, uh, what you call de-internationalization, uh, this uh, initiative was, made, was taken after a period with a high level of internationalization will with, with, with really a, a growth in the, in the number of, of international students coming to Denmark. So I think it's it's, it's really relevant to see that that uh, the, the development was like this and maybe slow down a little bit. So, but 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 you, I think you, we didn't really get the the background. Uh, the, the the view of, of on on the fact that this uh, this decision was made on, uh, of course you, you said that the the, the level of uh, grants for international students or for EU students went went from uh, uh, close to zero to to five hundred million kroners. So it, it, that that sort of shows that it's a quite generous system that we have in Denmark with a lot of uh, international students and I don't think there are much other, if, if any other European country uh, where, where international students can get grants as easily. I know I acknowledge that there might be technical issues <coughs> and things like that, but, but it is a generous system and it's a, it's a very, very internationalized high education system that we have in Denmark. So that, that, that's quite important to I notice. Just, I think this, and then, then, yes, then one on, other yeah. point, and that is that, that, that this initiative was not about reducing uh, or, or asking the universities to reduce, uh, or to say that, that specific persons from specific countries were not allowed to come to Denmark. It was a, a cut down in the number of, of uh, what you say, uh, uh, seats. seats, yeah, sort of seats in in uh, English spoken mm. um, programs. So yeah. that it affected Danish students at these programs as well as international sure. students. So yeah. just to make sure, well, because it, 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 it sounds like, like that it was targeted to, to exclude specific programs. Just don't let them talk. Broken all the EU rules to say Romanians can't. It might also be relevant to say that we have for decades we have had a, a, a cooperation among the Nordic countries. So, mm. so there is this a, a, a typical situation with, with mm. among the Nordic countries, which which should not be uh, forgotten. But it's quite telling here that oh. what we're discussing right now these are numbers, and we're not mm -hmm. talking about the content of yeah, international. And I think that's a very important yeah. point. I wish you could take that back to the ministry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. That, I mean, I, I completely agree there has been really heavy internationalization for quite some years. And I think 
I think it's fair to say, have we in some departments or in some disciplines, have we internationalized in the right way? And that's my concern, yeah. that yeah. we end up being so caught up in the numbers and categories mm -hmm. that we forget to discuss the content. And I hope you can take that back. And I wish we can talk more about it later because we, we need to leave now. But I think this thing about what is the content of internationalization, how do we make sure that we actually, for those who still have the opportunity to, to teach in English, make the most of having these wonderful internationalized students? Because it's easy for us. It's a wonderful program, but it's very easy to, to do all the right things when the program content is about anthropology, education, and globalization. But how do we make sure that this happens in other programs as well? We've got one person who's been very patient. Yeah, yeah, right. I know we're running out of time. But but the, minister, the main problem was two was needed afterwards. And then, yeah. then we only paid for the education. Why didn't we, for one year, two years, try to uh, improve them staying? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I heard right now um, a lot of universities are making uh, 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 team up with the, with the companies and organizations mm -hmm. in that way try to make it more easy than stay, yeah. because then the numbers uh, look much better. Yeah. If we did that for a couple of years, maybe, well. then, mm -hmm. why didn't you do that? Uh, why did you cut down on the other things? I also want to respond to your thing about the background on internationalization. I mean, there's a quick slide here. Um, this is the result of the 2003 reform that the universities were very much given a mandate to uh, internationalize. So, in a sense, what we've done is exactly what we've been asked to do. Um, and that was in two ways. One, we had to focus on research and education that would help the international uh, companies in Denmark, especially in the priority areas for the, uh, the, the global knowledge economy. And that's the universities have done. And the other one is that the ministry with the Foreign Office set up innovation centres around the world and we've produced PhDs, I've supervised PhDs of two of these science attaches now, one in China, one in India. Um, and their job is to link the Danish education to the education in those countries and link the companies and the research. So it's education, research and, and innovation. And um, that part of their job is to encourage students from those countries to come to Denmark to study. So we're sending ambassadors abroad to get students to come to Denmark to study. Where? We've got a lot in China who wanted to come to AG. We've got links in India who want to come to do AG. We're building up all these international links out of this momentum over the last 15, 16 years, where we have been doing as the government asked us to internationalize. Sorry? And they're yeah. self-paying. So they're self -paying, they're actually, yeah. So they don't cost them anything. anything. This, is, this is just profit for the universities exactly. and for Denmark. Um, Self-funded students coming from all over the place or else coming with uh, government grants from other countries. This is a massive um, effort that we've put into and it's very, very successful. Bonk. <laughs> self-paying students are, are not in the numbers. No, but they are in reality in the sense when you change a program from the English medium to Danish media, they are. Yes, yes. Yeah. But again, how, that's how can we recruit self paying students I, in I, a Danish I, I, I realize that it's not easy. I'm just saying, but uh, the other thing is that I think maybe due to you, and I, there's a micro and a macro level, and there's a university level where you can say you can there, what to do there, you came there, there, there are different knots and bolts. So there's very stuff to work with. Um, I mean, we aren't exceptional. If you look at what's no, happening yeah. in, Orborg, in uh, Orborg University, for example, yeah. where they've developed over 10 years yeah. new research areas in engineering, yeah. the programme goes, the staff have dispersed, the whole unit's gone. Yeah. I actually disagree with the link, the, the, dis, the semi-autonomous way that Klaus talked about. The, there are such close links between <laughs> education and yeah, research. Yeah. They're absolutely tied in. Yeah. We work together teaching. It generates research ideas. Our students create us international links to colleagues in America who invite us to international conferences. I mean, this is all one big bundle. And just add some numbers in and slash them about, and you start destroying the whole network.
But we're aware that it's also the university management who have made mm. some decisions that yeah. they could have made differently. Mm. So, so we're totally aware mm. of that. Mm-hmm. But they, I mean, they're not showing up. Yeah. <laughs> so you get a lot of frustration. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's completely fine. And on, on, on the whole, on, on the employment issue, the, it, it's yes, this was somewhat backwards, but that was a, a political decision, mm-hmm. and some to some ways tied to the SU agreement mm-hmm. that you mm-hmm. referenced. Yeah. Yes. Which, by the way, it's it's not a narrow agreement. It's not Danish folk party no. alone. No, it's no, a no, very broad. Yeah. It, that only very, makes it worse. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just to, you know, so that's what right. made me worry yeah. when Klaus said we're yeah. going to so change the government. Change it. Yeah. It's a political yeah. agreement across yeah. all the parties to do this. But but now, <laughs> so the so the minister is having now. Uh, uh, Discussions with the universities. He just had a meeting with the universities and the big employer unions and mm. different. And then he'll have with the with the, the, the mm. university academy colleges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, the, the yeah. Discussing how to to how to uh, raise employment. Right. And he's and he's very adamant that we should be better at at showing that this is this is it's a two way thing. This is not just. And negative. We also need to internationalize. Mm-hmm. And for him, it's very much saying it's not that we don't want you here, but we want you to stay mm-hmm. longer. Um, so it's, but the uh, other but point I think it would be really good to, yeah. to to take back to the ministry is the idea <coughs> that these courses, as if the English medium courses, are just standing on their own. Mm. And I'm, I think what we've done in DPU is exceptional. It really should be taken mm-hmm. as a a flagship for how to internationalise uh, programmes. But this way we've got a twinning between a Danish programme and an English mm. programme and how they prop each other up. Mm. And this builds on what Hannah's saying about be sensitive to the idea and the approach to internationalisation that's going on in different places. Mm. It's just a focus on numbers. You lose the texture of actually what the meaning of internationalisation is in different ways mm. and how it's going about, about mm. it. So I don't know how in a ministry you make them move away from numbers, <laughs> but if you can bring some more qualitative arguments yeah. into the picture, I think that would be fantastic if you could do that for us. Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> thank you. If Put the world on you, your shoulders now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's his job. Well, yeah. I, could, I, could, well, I, would, I would put it back and say, so we do the numbers and then we help the universities do the quality. Yeah, because, but not because, giving because, them enough no, time to do the quality. No, yeah, that, okay, that, it, yeah. it was a difficult yeah. process. But, it, but in, in general, that's the basic no, idea. I we do macro that's and that's universities do... I have to answer. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. I needed two hours, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Can I thank everybody, including uh, you coming from the ministry? It's extremely good to see you. Yeah. Very, very welcome. It was lovely to get your input. If you want any input from us into further discussions in the ministry, you know you've got some people yeah. here with some knowledge. So you're very welcome to all of us. Thank you very much for coming.